Tonight we are going to be focusing on Passover. Um, really, this is our Passion Week, uh, or as some call it, uh, Holy Week. And it begins with Palm Sunday, which was this past Sunday. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at the Passover story in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 12 is where we're going to be. Um, then Good Friday is remembering Christ's crucifixion. And it concludes with Resurrection Sunday, um, which really is just the beginning, isn't it? It's not the conclusion of the story, but it's the beginning for those of us who desire to repent of sin and trust in Christ. It's the beginning of new life in the Lord. And that can be yours tonight if you don't know the Lord. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, there's nothing more that God desires than relationship with you. He desires close, intimate friendship with you because he created you. And he created you in his image. And you are precious to him. And thus he longs for that relationship with you and you will only be satisfied when you come to the realization that you need Jesus Christ in your life. You might be able to get by for a few days, a few weeks, a few years, but if you strive in life and try to just live life without communion, relationship, and fellowship with Jesus Christ, you will live an empty, dry, joyless, passionless life that ultimately leads to death and eternal separation from the Lord. And the Lord doesn't want that for you. He wants to draw you close into his heart. His arms are wide open. The book of Revelation chapter three says that Jesus stands at the door of our hearts knocking. He says, if anyone will open the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So the Lord is knocking on the door of your heart tonight. And he's a gentleman, he will never, never intrude. He will never beat the door down because he has given us free will. Again, that goes back to his heart of love for us. He has created us as creatures of free will. But he wants us to respond to that knocking. And so if you haven't responded to Jesus' knocking on the door of your heart, do that tonight. He desires to come in and have fellowship with you and desires relationship with you. And so this Passion Week for us is really emphasizing and highlighting the week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And tonight we're gonna to be focusing on the Passover story. Now, what is Passover? Passover, just a brief definition, is the Old Testament feast that celebrates and remembers God's liberation of Israel from their slavery in Egypt. Now, some of you might be wondering or thinking, but on the calendar, you know, Passover is not until April. You know, we got some emails or uh, DMs on social media when they saw the Passover graphics saying, what are you doing? This Passover is not until April, it's April 22nd, which you're right. April 22nd is the beginning of Passover according to the Jewish calendar. So there's just simply a differences in calendars here. We in the West, we have the Gregorian calendar. The majority of the world goes by the Gregorian cal calendar. The Gregorian calendar, the Western calendar, it's a solar calendar. Uh, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. And so the Jewish calendar goes pr predominantly by uh, the lunar system, whereas the Western Gregorian calendar goes by the solar system. Um, and so uh, this year, um, Easter, is before on the Gregorian calendar, before Passover on the Jewish calendar. So they don't always line up, um, uh, the events don't always line up super well. Last year uh, it did, um, and Passover on the Jewish calendar was before Easter on our Western calendars, and so the events lined up last year. Uh, they don't always, so this year it's pretty off. So Easter is March 31st, uh, the Jewish celebration of Passover isn't until April the 22nd. Um, and so, but for us on the biblical timeline, you can't appreciate uh, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ without understanding 
the deeper meaning of the Passover celebration. And so here, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to remember and look at the Passover feast as instituted by God in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12. And thus, as we look deeper into this Passover celebration, it will only all the more highlight the greater significance of his resurrection as we celebrate this weekend. Um, So you can't really appreciate the resurrection without first understanding the significance of Passover. And then this is what Paul would say in the book of Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, to kind of squash any arguments on when should we celebrate feasts and celebrations and holidays. He would say in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are shadows of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. So what we're going to read tonight in Exodus chapter 12, when God institutes the Passover feast, it all is a foreshadow of what Christ would come to fulfill. All of this, Paul says, Christ is the substance. Christ is the reality of what took place in the Old Testament. And so as we dive into Exodus chapter 12, um, we're gonna highlight a few things that will just show the biblical significance of how Christ is the fulfillment. So before we dive in, let's, let's pray and commit our Passover service to the Lord and invite the Holy Spirit just to completely take over. Uh, Heavenly Father, that's what we do now. We ask that you would come by the power of your Spirit and that you would teach us now as we read your word. Lord, just flay our hearts wide open. Go to work as the great surgeon of our hearts and do what needs to be done in our lives tonight. Challenge us, correct us, rebuke us, encourage us, strengthen our faith, Lord, by the Holy Spirit through the reading of your word. We thank you for your death on the cross. You died on the cross for our sin to reconcile us back to the Father. Thank you, God. And we also look forward to celebrating your resurrection this weekend. Just be glorified now in our our midst, Lord. Do the work that only you can do now by the power of your spirits. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Here's what we're gonna focus on tonight. The Old Testament origin of Passover. And then finally, the symbolism and application of Passover for us today. So I've already invited you to turn to Exodus chapter 12. If you haven't gotten there, Go to Exodus 12 now, and before I start reading, just to kind of set up some of the context here, and to look at the origin of the Passover celebration. Here in Exodus chapter 12, the year is roughly 1450 BC, about 1450 years before the birth of Christ. So... Here is the time scale, 1450 BC roughly is the date. And if you know your Bibles, you know the context. There is a famine in the land of Canaan. And Jacob, one of the patriarchs, uh, he has 12 sons that later become the uh, the tribes of Israel. So you have Abraham, the father of Uh, the nation of Israel, the father of our faith in many ways. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob, right? Jacob has 12 sons, but there's a famine in the land. And you guys know your Bibles. They get upset at this boy named Joseph. And Joseph, um, he's a good guy. Bible says he's a handsome guy, um, but he's a brat. And he uh, gets on the nerves of his brothers, And remember, he says, I've got this coat of many colors because I'm dad's favorite, kind of rubs it in their faces. And they have an idea, okay, let's kill Joseph. One of the brothers speaks up and says, okay, let's not kill him, let's just sell him. So they sell him into slavery. Joseph lands up in Egypt. Long story short, Joseph rises to prominence in the land of Egypt, goes from 
um, prison, being falsely accused of something he didn't do, but then is given this place of prominence in the land of Egypt. And the Bible then says that Joseph is placed in second in command only to the Pharaoh. And so then there's a famine in the land of Canaan, Israel. Jacob sends the boys down because Joseph, given wisdom by God, Joseph preserves food in the land of Egypt. And so the boys come down and in order to get grain from Joseph, they don't even realize it's Joseph. Joseph then reveals himself to his brothers. There's a whole awesome Jewish family reunion. And then Joseph says, go back to my dad, Jacob, and bring him and the whole family back to the land of Egypt. You guys are going to be safe here in the land of Egypt. So there's roughly, the nation of Israel at this time is roughly 70 people large. 70 people migrate from the land of Israel to the land of Egypt. And there they set up camp in the land of Egypt. That is home base for the land, uh, in the land of Egypt for the Hebrew people. They're with Joseph and his brothers and their kids and their kids. And, but later the Bible says that a new Pharaoh rises to prominence. The old Pharaoh dies. A new Pharaoh comes to power and he doesn't remember the, the old Joseph. He doesn't remember Joseph. And so what was once a land of freedom and security and prosperity for the Hebrew people, they're being saved from their famine, now becomes a land of enslavement. The new Pharaoh, the new king of Egypt, rises to power and he enslaves the Hebrew people. The Bible says that they are slaves in the land of Egypt for 430 years. 430 years. Now the, land, the uh, people of Israel, the Hebrew people are roughly uh, a million to five million people large at this time. So they have multiplied greatly living that there in the land of Goshen they're in Egypt, and they are slaves now in the land of Egypt. And then you get to Exodus chapter 2, and the Bible says that the cries of his people reach him, and he has compassion on his people. The Bible says that they groan in their slavery, and they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord hears his people. Now, we could stop there and have an awesome, encouraging Bible study right there in Exodus chapter 2. And just to encourage you tonight, just as God heard the cry of his people when they were in slavery, in bondage, the Lord hears his people today. And maybe you've been praying and you've been seeking the Lord for something. And with that, there has been great suffering and you have been wondering why the Lord seems silent. Listen, the Lord's silence does not mean the Lord's absence. Just because sometimes the Lord seems silent doesn't mean the Lord is absent. God still hears the prayers and cries of his people. And someone needs to hear that tonight and be encouraged by that tonight. Maybe you've been praying for a loved one for years. Maybe you've been praying through a health crisis for years. The Lord hears you. And the Lord will answer according to his will, not according to ours. Why? Because Father knows best, and God knows what's best for his kids. And he will meet you in wonderful, intimate ways by the power of his Holy Spirit. If you would surrender whatever is going on in your life to the Lord, trusting and knowing that the Lord hears the prayers and cries of his people, and saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to submit this to you. You hear, you know. And I'm going to trust just as you heard the cries of your people in their slavery in Egypt, that you hear my prayers today. And the Lord does. The Bible says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he is near to all those who call on him. Did you know that? That's what the Bible says. The Lord is near to all those who call on him. He is close to the brokenhearted. So just a side note of encouragement for you, God hears you and he sees you and he knows what's going on in your life. Continue to meet with him. The Lord doesn't always answer our prayers according to our timetable. Why? Because the Lord wants us to continually go back to him. And this is the way of the Lord drawing us closer to himself. There have been times in my own life where I have been meeting with the Lord in intense prayer. Lord, why, why have you allowed this to happen in my life? And he doesn't always fix my problems at the snap of a finger. But it's the Lord's way of drawing me closer to himself. Why? So that you can 
grow in maturity and dependency upon the Lord and in intimacy with him. And he does that. He draws you in like a good dad does. And he brings you close to his heart. And you get in the word and you learn more about the truths of who God is and his character and his fatherly nature. And he desires to draw you into his heart. So don't stop praying. Continue to seek the Lord. He is there and he hears you. And this was the Israelite people 3,400 years ago in their Egyptian slavery, slaves for 430 years, praying and crying out to the Lord. The Bible says that God hears, heard their prayers, heard their cry, and then what does he do? He raises up the deliverer, Moses. Moses then, filled with God's power, goes back to the new Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. You know the story. But what does it take? It takes 10 different plagues that God sends upon the Egyptians for then Pharaoh's stubborn heart to finally release the Israelites from their slavery. Now, in order to really appreciate the Passover, we first have to understand the significance of the plagues. You can't appreciate the Passover feast until we learn something about the plagues. The real purpose of the plagues was not necessarily to liberate the Hebrews from their slavery. Yes, that was part of it, certainly. But it wasn't the only reason that God decided to send the plagues. He sent the plagues not just to rescue the Hebrews, but to make a statement about his deity. If the Lord's main purpose, if the Lord's only reason was to liberate the Hebrews from their slavery, it wouldn't have taken God 10 plagues. I hope you know that. God could have sent one cataclysmic blow to the Pharaoh to free his people from their slavery. So then why does God choose to send 10 plagues? Not just to liberate his people from their slavery, but again, to make a statement about his deity. You have to know this. God's desire was not just to liberate his people, but God's desire, the Bible tells us, in sending the 10 plagues was to not only let the Israelite people know who he was, but to send a message to the Egyptians and the surrounding nations that God is the only true God of the universe. Uh, my parents uh, were in Egypt just a few weeks ago, and when my dad was here on a Sunday a few weeks ago, he showed some pictures of the pyramids and all that awesome stuff. Um, and if he told this story, forgive me for repeating it, because um, when he got home, he told my family this pretty awesome story, but when they got home from Egypt, um, their tour guide uh, was there from Egypt. She was a Muslim. And my dad gave a Bible study um, on this passage from Exodus 2 to 12, talking about the 10 plagues that God sent upon the Egyptians. And the Bible says that the 10 plagues were not just to reveal God to the Israelites, but the 10 plagues were so that God could make himself known even to the Egyptians, so that the Egyptians might even turn from their pagan idolatry and worship the true God. And so my dad has given this Bible study there along the Nile, and at the end of the week, the Muslim tour guide who lived there in Egypt um, as an Egyptian, many Egyptians are Muslim, and so this Egyptian Muslim tour guide, she goes up to my parents and she says, I want to know that God that you speak of. Uh, how can I have a relationship with him? <laughs> Pretty awesome. So can you, can you believe this, that this story 3,400 years ago, roughly, where God desired to make himself known, not just to the Israelites, but to the Egyptians as well. 3,400 years later, this white Caucasian pastor is there in, in, in Egypt speaking to an Egyptian Muslim, and she overhears the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God desires to make himself known as the true God, as the one true God, to not just his people, the Israelites, but to even the Egyptians. And so she uh, prayed to receive Christ, and uh, my mom gave her a Bible, and, uh, and so we pray for her even to this day, that the Lord would continue to mature her in her new walk with the Lord. But pretty awesome story, right? So this was God's main purpose not just to reveal his superiority, 
his authority, his divinity and deity to the Israelite people, but also to the Egyptians. You have to remember this and, and know this. The Israelites have been, at this point in biblical history, they have been saturated by pagan thought, worship, and customs for roughly 430 years. So the Israelites, their concept and idea of who Yahweh, the one true God is, is blurred because they have been saturated by the pagan worship and customs of the Egyptians. And you have to know this as well, the Egyptian culture, one of the most polytheistic religions and cultures in human existence. And so Israel, living in the land of Egypt, being slaves in the land of Egypt for 430 years, you have to imagine, they are being saturated with all of this pagan idolatry. That's why, no surprise, when they finally are freed from their slavery, Moses parts the Red Sea, they, they get to Mount Sinai. Exodus 32 says, when Moses is up at the top of the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, the, the, the Israelites... They, they set up this, this bull, this calf god, and they worship this calf god. Why? Because that's what they knew. That's what they were familiar with. They say to Moses' brother, Aaron, Aaron, your, your brother Moses has been on the mountain for too long. We don't know what's going on. We want to worship another god. This is the god who, who really freed us from our slavery. Moo god, cow god. This is the God we want to worship. Why? Because that was what was familiar to them. They had been saturated and engulfed in pagan polytheistic worship and customs. And so Yahweh, the one true God, uses the 10 plagues to make himself known to the Israelites because their view and concept of God has been blurred and to the Egyptians who are polytheistic in nature and so he uses these 10 plagues to get everybody's attention. There's only one God. That's me, Yahweh, the one true God. I love you. I desire to make myself known to you. But the Lord has to use some pretty intense measures to get their attention. How many of you can relate? The Lord will sometimes use intense, significant things in our lives to finally wake us up to who he truly is. I... I am so dumb and slow. You can ask my dad and my wife, and they will tell you that I, I have brown hair, but I am blonde. I, I'm, I, things go above my head. They go over my head. I can be clueless at times. And so the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, has to wake me up and sometimes use significant, intense measures to finally get my attention. That's what he does sometimes with us as believers. We are either distracted by the cares and ways of the world, and the Lord has to wake us up. This is what he does with the Egyptians, and he uses these 10 plagues to wake them up and to make himself known. Now, again, why these 10 plagues? These 10 plagues were a direct aim at the Egyptian false gods. Every single plague is going to be a direct hit or aim on the false gods of the Egyptians to reveal Yahweh's absolute superiority over everything in creation and specifically the false gods of the Egyptians. So real quickly, we're not gonna read the passages, but go home, read Exodus 7 through 12. I'm gonna just gonna quickly walk us through the 10 plagues just to show us the significance of what God is trying to do here. So plague number one was turning the Nile River into blood. Now you have to know this, the 10 plagues are not just some insignificant thing that God was just doing to wake them up. This is a direct aim at the false gods of the Egyptians. The Nile was revered as a God who gave Egypt life and fertility. Now it has become a bloody representation of death. So again, God is taking direct aim at who the Egyptians worship. Oh, you worship the Nile River? You think that the God or goddess of the Nile is the one who brings life and fertility? He turns the Nile into blood, the representation of death. Plague number two was frogs. Now, Heket was Egypt, uh, Egypt's frog-headed goddess of fruitfulness. 
And now frogs killed the land with the stink of death. Number three, God sends gnats, the plague of gnats. Egyptian magicians couldn't copy or replicate this plague. Plague number four was flies. Now flies were revered as embodying life from death, but now the biting flies tormented the very people who worship flies. Everybody get this. Number five here, the death of the livestock. Now the Egyptians revered cattle as divine. Again, why did in Exodus 32, the Egyptians raise up cow god? Because this is what was familiar to them, the Egyptians revered cattle as divine. Amun-Ra, the chief god of Egypt, was pictured as a bull. And now God shows his sovereignty over their chief god. Number six was festering boils. The Egyptians were powerless to prevent the boils, were even unable to stand in the presence of Moses. Number seven was hail. The Egyptian god Osiris represented vegetation, and now the Egyptians are seeing that Osiris, the god over our vegetation, is unable to prevent Yahweh from killing our crops. Same thing with hail, or with locusts, plague number eight. The Lord used locusts to destroy vegetation, vegetation as a direct hit on the Egyptian false god Osiris. Plague number nine was darkness. Now the Egyptians worshiped the sun god, the father of mankind, and the Lord is now demonstrating sovereignty over Ra, their sun god, by blanketing the land in complete darkness. And then finally, plague number 10, the death of the firstborn, the Pharaoh was seen as the reincarnation of the sun god Ra. And so then naturally, Pharaoh's son, would then be seen and worshipped as the second reincarnation of their sun god Ra. Now again, I know this seems like a very significant measure that God is taking here, but it's God's last demonstration and wake-up call that Pharaoh and his son will not be the incarnation of the sun god Ra, for there is so, no such deity, but that God is the only true God. Again, these are direct hits on the Egyptian false gods. Now, here in Exodus chapter 12, we'll read it here. Passover happens between plagues 9 and 10. And so Passover is instituted by God right before plague number 10, the death of the firstborn. And there's a reason for that. Let's begin reading now, Exodus chapter 12. Let's read the first 13 verses together. Exodus chapter 12, verse one, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Verse five, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, this is confusing to us. I'm gonna come back and we'll unpack all of this. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill the lamb at twilight, verse seven, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and, and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So this is the Passover feast, verse nine, it says, do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with the belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you, you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, or in the Hebrew, Pesach. 
Verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will, here's our word, pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Okay, pause there with me. So God here institutes the Passover feast. And what God is telling his people to do is I want you to take a lamb, one year old, a male lamb, on the 10th day of Nisan, inspect it, make sure it's without blemish or defect. On the 14th day of Nisan, slaughter the lamb, and then take the blood from that lamb, take a hyssop branch, which is basically a, a paintbrush, there's a plant, dip the hyssop branch into the blood of the lamb and paint your doorposts, the top of the doorposts and the sides with the blood of the lamb. And when I see the blood on your doorposts, I will pass over your home so that I will not kill the firstborn in your household. But whatever home does not have the blood of the lamb, that home will experience my judgment and the final 10th plague, they will experience the death of the firstborn. This is all foreshadowing the greater picture of what Jesus Christ would do for us. We're gonna walk through this passage and we're gonna find some symbolism and application of the Passover. Application number one, in Christ, every believer is a new creation. Why? Let's check out verse 1 and 2 together. In verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. The first month of the year to you. God is basically saying, This is going to be the first month of your calendar. The first month. In, in the Hebrew, before... Um, Israel took on the Babylonian calendar later in their history. This was the month of Aviv. Now, later in Israel's history, they would adopt the Babylonian calendar. So we no longer say Aviv, but it's Nisan. Um, but here in the Hebrew, the first month of their new calendar year as instituted by God, this is the month of Aviv. Now, what's super interesting here is this is intended again to be the first month of their calendar year. Uh, today, Israel has adopted, they've gone away from their religious calendar, they've adopted a civil calendar, and so the nation of Israel today, they celebrate their new year in September, our September, their, they'd call it Tishri, which typically is around our September. Um, and so they've gone away from the religious calendar, they've adopted that civil calendar, but um, again, the month of Aviv, or Nisan would be around our March, April. And so here God is instituting this Passover feast to kind of commemorate new beginnings. This is gonna be a new beginning for you, is what he's telling the land of Israel. And thus our application and symbolism for us is for those of us who are in Christ, you can experience a new beginning in the Lord. This is what Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new beginning. The old has gone, the new has come. You need to know this and hear this because if you are here tonight as a believer and you still, even though you've gone to the Lord confessing sin, turning from sin, repenting of sin, confessing sin before the Lord, the Bible says he has forgiven you of sin if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As far as the east is from the west, so far will I remove your transgressions from you. These are the promises for the repentant believer. But some of us, we still fall prey to the guilt and shame of our past. And you need to know this, that if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. The old person is gone. And God, by his Holy Spirit, it completely transforms our lives from the inside out. And you can experience a new beginning in the Lord when you repent and place your faith in Christ. If you're here tonight, you've never made a decision to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You can have a new beginning. I don't care what you've done in your past. 
When you confess your sin and the sin of your past to the Lord, the Bible says he's faithful to forgive you and cleanse you and wash you from all unrighteousness. And then he gives you his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. And so when God looks at you and me as believers, he doesn't see the sin, the guilt, and shame of our past, but he sees us as he sees his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And this now, when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, is a life of new beginnings. And you need to hear this, that God desires to do a new thing, a new work in your life when you repent of sin and trust in him. And so the old is gone. The new has come. And rest in the new future and the new beginning that you've been given in Christ. And this is what God is telling the nation of Israel, that this Passover feast is going to commemorate a new beginning of relationship with me. And that's what Christ has done for us. Now, continue in verse 3, where it says, God says, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the 10th of this month, Okay, so the 10th day of Aviv, or the 10th day of Nisan, on the 10th of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Okay, there is also amazing symbolism and significance here in verses three through five. God instructs Moses to instruct the congregation of Israel that on the 10th, day of Nisan. I want you to see how detailed God is. On the 10th day of Nisan, I want you to take a lamb that's one year old. Why is that significance? A one year old lamb is in its prime. It's the prime of its life. Again, on the 10th day, taking a, a male lamb, then who is without spot or defect. So on the 10th day of Nisan, they were to find again a lamb who was without defect, and they were to inspect that lamb. They were to kind of go through that lamb with a fine-tooth comb, making sure there were no blemishes or deformities. So this was to be a lamb without blemish or defect, and the inspection of that lamb, again, would take place on the 10th day of that first month. Why is this significant? Because then when you get to the New Testament, Jesus, who the Bible calls the Lamb of God, rode in on a donkey on Palm Sunday on exactly the 10th day of Nisan. On the 10th day of Nisan, Jesus rides in on a donkey, Palm Sunday, and is being thus inspected by the people and religious leaders. If you keep reading in your Bibles there, on that Palm Sunday, Jesus is inspected, interrogated by some pretty tough questions by the religious leaders. Jesus would then be inspected, how? By Pilate, by Caiaphas, by Annas, by Caiaphas again, uh, by Pilate again. And then Pilate would say in, uh, I believe it's John... Um, I wrote it down, John 18, verse 38, I find no fault in this man. This is a man who the Bible calls the Lamb of God who was found to be without defect, blameless, spotless, without sin, just so happened to be riding in on the 10th day of Nisan for his inspection day. God is so in the details. Again, trying to wake us up as Gentiles, yes, but all the more as the Jewish people, that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is your Passover Lamb. This is your Messiah, the Anointed One. And so the symbolism, the typology, and the application for us tonight is Christ is the inspected Lamb without blemish or defect. Peter would write in 1 Peter 1.19, you were not redeemed with corruptible things, talking to us as believers, talking about our redemption. You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with precious blood that is found in Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish or without spot. 
This is Jesus Christ. Continue reading in verse six. There's more to the story here where he says in verses six and seven, now you shall keep it until the 14th day. Now circle that in your Bibles. That's very significant to our story as well. Okay, so the lamb would be inspected on the 10th day, but then sacrificed or slaughtered on the 14th day. He says again in verse six, now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Okay, when is twilight? That's how the New King James translates this. Twilight would have been roughly between 3 and 6 p.m. Now again, God is all up in the details here, saying that this lamb, inspected on the 10th day, slaughtered on the 14th day, and he's supposed to be slaughtered or killed, his blood should be shed at a specific time on the 14th day between uh, 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., or twilight as the New King James translates it. Verse 7, and they shall take some of the blood of the lamb and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel, that's just the top door frame of the house, where they eat. Okay, this is exactly then speaking about New Testament significance. The 14th day of Nisan is exactly when the Bible then tells us in the Gospels that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. Jesus comes in on Palm Sunday, riding on the donkey, inspected by the religious leaders on the 10th day. He is then crucified on the 14th day. But again, God is all up in the details here. He's not only crucified on the 14th day of Nisan, where the Gospels actually tell us that Jesus' crucifixion began at 9 a.m., but the Bible says that he breathed his last and died on the cross at 3 p.m., twilight. Exactly the time when lambs all over the nation of Israel were being slaughtered. Again, God is very ordered and structured and detailed here so that we can't miss the significance of the picture that God is trying to paint to his people. The male lamb inspected on the 10th day, slaughtered on the 14th day, is a picture and a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do for us, riding on the donkey on the 10th day, being then slaughtered or crucified for our sins on the 14th day at exactly that same time that lambs are being slaughtered, 3 p.m. Now, some little application here. God is not only in on the details of the plan of salvation, but God cares about the details of your life. And you need to understand that. The Bible tells us in Psalm 37, verse 26, that God delights in the details of your life. He delights in the details of your life. Some of us sometimes have the ten tendency to think God doesn't see, God doesn't care, God doesn't understand what I'm going through. God sees and he cares about even the details of your life. And God here in his plan of salvation, he is very meticulous, he is very detailed. And again, all of this was to foreshadow what Christ would finally do for us on the cross. And then verse seven where it says, and they shall take some of the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorposts. This would then symbolize for us Christ shed blood for us on the cross and how we need to be covered by the blood of the lamb to be rescued from condemnation. Okay, do you see this? That for those in the Old Testament, at the instituting of Passover, for those who would have the blood over their doorposts, the angel of death would pass over. That's why we call this celebration Passover. The angel of death would pass over the homes that had the blood so that they would not experience God's judgment or condemnation. And the same goes for us who are in Christ Jesus. When we hide ourselves in Christ and we apply the blood of Christ to our lives, God's judgment passes over us as believers in Jesus Christ. Again, for there therefore now is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, God applies the blood of Jesus Christ to your life so that his judgment and his condemnation passes over you. 
But the only way that God's judgment passes over you is if you believe by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that his death achieved for us the rescuing of our sin, the rescuing of us from sin, from death, when we trust in Christ's blood for our salvation. All of this is an amazing, beautiful picture of what Christ came to do for us. Romans 3.25 said that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Romans 5.9 says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? John 1.29, John the Baptist said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Finally, we'll just look at verse 8, and then we'll partake in communion together and remember Christ's sacrifice Then in verse eight, he says, then they shall eat the flesh on that night, talking about the flesh of the lamb, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, that's significant, and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. The three most important elements of the Passover, or as Jews today would refer to it as the Seder dinner. Seder just means order. There's an order to the elements. The three most important elements that are found here in Exodus chapter 12 of this Passover celebration was to be unleavened bread, that's significant, bitter herbs, that's significant, and the Passover lamb. Unleavened bread, God says, was to to be a part of this Passover celebration. Why? Because in their haste, in leaving the land of Egypt, They didn't have time to allow the bread to rise. You need yeast or leaven in your bread uh, for it to rise. God is saying, you don't have time for that. I'm about to deliver you from your slavery. Make your bread unleavened, without leaven, without yeast. And so today, this is why in communion, we have just a flat cracker. Um, It's unleavened bread. And in the Seder dinner, that's what they eat today, unleavened bread. Leaven all throughout the Bible is symbolic of sin. Even in Exodus chapter 12, they were to not have any yeast or leaven in their homes. Clear their homes out of all yeast, all leaven. Why? Again, because it's a picture of sin. How Christ's sacrifice cleanses us and washes us from sin. Jesus then, when he applies this at the Passover celebration before his crucifixion, he's meeting with his disciples in the upper room, having this Passover celebration. He takes the unleavened bread, bread without leaven, and he applies it to his own body. The Bible says that Jesus was without sin, yet he took on the sin of the world, took on our sin. And because Jesus was the perfect lamb without sin, he was able to be that perfect lamb to sacrifice, be that sacrificial lamb to take away our sin. Unleavened bread, bread without yeast, no sin is to be a part of the life of the believer, but no sin was found in Jesus Christ. He, was a, he lived a life without sin. Bitter herbs, significant, why? It was a reminder of their bitter slavery, that God was redeeming them from their bitter slavery. And again, the Passover lamb is a reminder of God's judgment that passed over the homes marked with the blood. Slide number four, our final slide. Jesus lived a sinless life and saves us from the greater slavery of sin when we repent and trust in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is what Passover is all about. In our remaining five minutes, I'm going to call the ushers forward. We're going to partake in communion Ben's gonna come out and we're gonna sing a song. And this is what communion, the Passover celebration is all about. How Jesus came to rescue us, not just from, yes, their physical slavery and bondage in the land of Egypt. It was all pointing to the greater liberation of our spiritual enslavement. The Bible likens our spiritual sin nature to slavery. All throughout the book of Romans, Paul would say that we are a slave to sin. 
And that Jesus Christ, his mission when he died on the cross was to liberate us from this greater spiritual bondage that we all experience as humans. We're slaves of sin. But when you trust in Jesus' shed blood and body on that cross for your salvation, the Bible says that he frees you from your bondage to sin. And no longer are you slaves of sin, but the Bible says now we're slaves of righteous living. And when you trust in Christ, he fills you with his Holy Spirit and he promises a freedom that you can only experience when you come to the cross. Again, if you're here tonight and you feel like you're a slave to sin, you're a slave to habitual sinful addiction and practices, the only way that you can be liberated from that spiritual bondage is when you surrender to Jesus Christ and say, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you fill my life? I believe you died on the cross for my sin and that your shed blood can apply to me tonight when I place my faith in you. And so, Lord, we just remember your sacrifice tonight. We thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. Your blood shed for us, your body beaten and bruised for us and nailed to the cross was your way of liberating us from our spiritual bondage of sin. Thank you for forgiving us. If you have not received Christ or surrendered to Christ tonight, just whisper a prayer to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I believe you died on the cross for me and rose again. Come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And that's what we remember tonight, Lord, your sacrifice for us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.